Aloha and welcome to Inside Hawaii Real Estate. I'm Will Tanaka and my wife and business partner, Leonie Lam, and I bring you the latest in Hawaii real estate. Today, we give a warm welcome to Sean Tiwanak, owner and principal appraiser of Appraise It Hawaii, a locally and family owned residential real estate appraisal service serving the local community since 2004, over two decades. Sean was a graduate of the Kamehameha Schools, attended Loyola Marymount University in LA, and ultimately received his bachelor's degree from University of Hawaii with a focus on business and uh, managerial accounting. So perfect for appraisal. In 2006, he returned from the mainland to uh, begin working with his family Appraise Hawaii. This is a family-owned business, as I mentioned earlier, with his mom, Mary Tiwanak, who became an appraiser back in the 1990s. And over time, Sean and his other family members have become certified residential appraisers. So welcome, Sean. Hey, well, thanks for having me. Nice to be here. You know, the appraisal world is, um, I mean, everyone talks about appraisals, but in terms of, you know, what is appraisals? What's the importance of it? Some misconception. Mm -hmm. I mean, I want to really dig deep with you today. Yeah, let's start with the foundation, the very basic. What is a real estate appraisal? Yeah, so the, the basically, the, the simplest terms are an appraisal is an opinion. You have certain things in a, in a financial transaction that are a fact. The listing price is a fact. The, the final sales price is a fact. But an appraisal is actually a, an opinion that is formulated through um, one of three different methods that we use to uh, determine market value. And when we talk about market value, what we really uh, are talking about is certain definitions of what market value is. Sometimes people throw around the term fair market value. But um, when whenever you engage an appraiser, we work on a definition of market value. And what that is, is what our job is to do is, first of all, we do not represent a buyer or a seller, the lender or appraisal management company. And my sister put it to me this way. Our job is to represent the house. So in order for us to do our job appropriately, we need to adhere by federal standards and that's called USPAP. That's the uniform, or I'm sorry, the um, um, uh, uniform standards of professional appraisal practice. It's called USPAP. You can look that up. And part of that is uh, our, our mandate and we're held legally to these standards and we can get, get in a lot of trouble, including fines and um, even, uh, you know, litigation against us for not adhering to the principle of independence. So we need to be independent. We need to be unbiased and objective in our in our decision-making. And that's why I say we represent the house. It's not our job to be an advocate, you know? And if you find yourself becoming an advocate for someone or you're too close to the situation, then you're required to disclose that and remove yourself. You cannot be unbiased anymore. Sometimes you just have biases that creep into a, uh, your evaluation process because you don't like the color paint. You don't like this kind of flooring. Personal, we have to look beyond that. But I, again, I go back to this market value and sorry for taking that little tangent, but it is important. A market value is what our job is to do is to look at the most probable price that a piece of real estate will sell for. And in my case, it's residential land and um, uh, condos and, and houses uh, up to four. For, for income houses, for income earned properties. And what is the most probable price that it's going to sell at uh, in an open market, meaning anybody can have access to um, you know, the, the, the property as far as being a buyer, um, that it's a non-arm's length sale. I mean, that it's an arm's length sale, that the parties are unrelated and they don't have any sort of relation. They're all typically motivated. Everyone is uh, in both parties are, um, operating with their own self-interest in mind and in a reasonable time period. So what we do is we take a look at what the average um, days on market might be, for example. And right now on this island, it tends to be under 60 days for the most part, under right. two months as average. So um, what is the most probable price that that property would sell for given that criteria? And if this price is too low, it would sell in one or two days and be off the market quickly. 
If it's too high, it's going to stay on the market for three to six months. So essentially, your appraisal is a uh, systematic evaluation of what the most probable price that your property would sell for. And, and we can talk a little bit later on how you would use that information because you could use that information in a number of different ways. Yeah, let me ask you a question. So in terms of uh, maintaining independence, yeah. um, have you ever had situations or have you heard of situations where maybe, you know, they weren't, maybe they may have been biased? Historically, mm -hmm. and I remember working in, in the office with my mom in the early 2000s, and this is before 2008. And it was common for lenders or some party in the financial transaction to try to incentivize us to give them a value that they, they wanted. And that was an issue. And my mother was a really a awesome appraiser. Um, she's no longer with us, but you know we still carry on her traditions and the way she, she brought us up. But she would never uh, go with that because it was against our professional standards. What happened in 2008, we had a big crash in the market, right? We, we all know that the bubble burst and the market just plummeted. If you look back at that, there were some legislators that put that burden firmly on the shoulders of appraisers and said it was our fault. Mm. Um, so as a result, in 2008, um, new legislation was adopted and no longer can a lender, the bank, and uh, communicate directly with the appraiser. So since then, they have implemented what is known as an appraisal management company. It's a third party. So the lender cannot choose their own appraiser or try to influence them in any way. So the appraisal management company will take the order from the lender now for, for commercial transactions, for mortgage lending, and then they would assign it to an appraiser. And we're not allowed to communicate with the lender at any point. So now there are safeguards in place. Uh, to prevent what happened before, because in the past, people were flipping communities, um, you know, working together to try to inflate prices um, artificially. And um, our family never got involved with that. And um, today, it's a little bit more, I would say, um, subtle. You know, people will tell you a little bit of a sob story, try to get you on their side if it's a divorce, a personal thing. Um, but you know, it's very important for us and in terms of my family and the way we do our business that we just remain objective and um, unbiased. And our job is, and it's clearly stated in the USPAP rules, the Uniform uh, uh, Appraisal Practice um, Principle, um, you know, uh, but the, um, you know, we are not to be an advocate for anyone. We don't advocate for any side. It's a divorce. It. So, which can get a little difficult because especially in personal appraisals where you have family members trying to buy each other out for property or a divorce situation, oftentimes somebody's not going to be happy with the value we provide. And we, we just have to live with that. But again, the goal is our job is to represent the house. And if you can maintain that sort of focus and that you can do you can do the right thing in, in, in performing your analysis. Yeah, let's talk about the different scenarios where people would hire you beyond just a real, yeah. uh, real estate transaction on the market. You know, there's there's a lender. You mentioned divorce. So in a right. divorce situation where there's a married couple, they're divorcing, do they usually have one appraiser or do they have independent, so two separate appraisers appraising the, the property? I've seen it all, all different ways. Um, the, the most recent one that I've done, um, the attorneys for both parties had each side approve me as their appraiser in this case yeah. um, i am working on a uh, another project right now where it's a family buying out and they have three appraisers one for each party and that happens too um and i also see in divorce cases where people are very amicable so it just depends on how contentious that is but going back to your original question is why would you get an appraisal there's a very wide spectrum of reasons and Sometimes you just have those people that get their house appraised every so often because they want to know what it's worth. Um, but generally speaking, the most common reason is for estate. Uh, mm -hmm. If you have a family member that uh, passes away and you inherit property or someone it goes into a trust, 
it's just golden. I've talked to CPAs about this. It is the best time to get an appraisal as soon as possible. The, the sooner you get it, the easier it is to uh, ascertain what the market value is. And the reason why you need that is because whenever it comes time to dispose of the asset, or if you're using it to earn income as a rental property, you need to establish a tax basis. And that really helps the um, person who inherited the property, who it transfers to. Let's say uh, your, your folks bought a, a property and it was, uh, you know, you see these people, they bought a property in the, in the early 60s or 50s, they paid $50,000 for it in Pro City, and now it's a million dollars. Right, right. Well, the, the capital gains on that would be your responsibility to pay nine hundred thousand dollars, let's say. However, if you do a um, an, what we call date of death, it's known as a retrospective appraisal in our terminology. Then um, the IRS and the federal government actually sets the the price or the value at that time as your tax basis and you you already have certain benefits this is one of the few times that the government just gives you money flat out you know or forgives you um and, and I, I believe it's about two hundred thousand dollars that you're allowed anyway uh but that's gold i have had to go back like 26 years to do some of these retrospectives because people had never done an appraisal that so i recommend that if you if you do inherit property get an appraisal done as soon as possible the closer to the time of the passing of, of your loved one, the, the easier it is to ascertain value. There's more data readily available and there are less assumptions that we have to make. You know, if you think about what a house might have been like 20 years ago, yeah. you know, sometimes there's been additions. Um, we, that's how we need to look at it. What was it like back then? Uh, another big reason uh, clearly is um, People who are cashing out of uh, family trusts and they want to buy out property that's been inherited and family members that call us because they need to know what the current market value is. And then you have divorce, which brings up a whole new question about how do then people come to us and say, hey, our, our tax assessed value is, well, we just use a million because it's easy to talk in those type of round figures um, and, and, you know, or they look on Zillow and they find a price. So what's the difference between that and assessed value and your appraised value? I mean, it's something we can totally get into if you... Can we get into that? Because yeah. oftentimes uh, many consumers rely on online mm -hmm. Zillow and some other online platforms, and they'll just look at that as, you know, they have a Zillow estimate, for example. Right, your Zestimate. And, yeah, Zestimate, <laughs> exactly. Yeah. And... In terms of uh, you know how they come up with that, if it's AI, and then there's a tax assessed value, which is the the um, the Sydney and County Real Property Tax website, right. where you go and they have their own computer generated um, tax appraised value. Can we kind of tackle each one and how do you address that? And uh, you know from your standpoint, the tax assessed value is never going to be what your market value is. The market yeah. is dynamic; it's always changing. Look what's happening right now. Interest rates just dropped. Mm -hmm. Supply and demand is always changing. There's cyclical things that happen in terms of when people buy and sell. So that is a fluid market, right? It stays relatively stable, but it changes. Right. So talking about assessed tax value, those assessed values are assigned prior to the beginning of the year. So if anything, that gives you an, sort of an idea of what the assessor's office ascribed as a tax value. And it's, historically, it's always, it has been less. Yeah. Last year, tax assessed values were more a lot of times than your appraised value. Mm -hmm. Why is that? It's because they do a mass appraisal, that what they call it. They use automated valuation models. And one thing about AVMs, the automated valuation models, and it's become a bigger and bigger topic in, in recent uh, months even, and partially because of AI, is um, that what you get out is only as good as what you put in. Mm -hmm. And the tax assess value is based on historical market trends from the year before. So case in point, in 2022, um, the, fact the, the market was going up, and in 2021, it wasn't as much. So the market value tend to lag in an increasing market. Mm -hmm. 
2023, we had a decline in prices and the, um, the assessed values are based on the 2022 um, market trend. So tax assessed value was greater in most cases for a long time throughout last year uh, than your appraised value. Mm. So those are used to determine how much you pay for tax. Not really going to tell you what your house is worth on the market. Um, and um, the same point is going to apply with your estimate. Okay. What they do is they take a look at a lot of different properties in an area over a greater period of time than what we would do as an appraiser because one of the key things that we look at besides um, you know, the location and everything is the recency. You want to look at the most recent data possible. Ideally, homes that have sold within three months. The estimate doesn't really do that. And it also makes a ton of assumptions. If you live in an area like, let's say, Kailua, um, it's going to look at all these various properties without getting into the nitty gritty of individual differences in the location, things that might be affecting your value, like you're next to the beach or right next to the freeway, then positive and negative effects or a busy road. And then the big things that we look at when we go to a property. And so that's why it's very important for us to physically go there and see what type of improvements have been made to the property, if any. Does it match public records? Have, are there unpermitted living areas? And then the, the big things we look at is quality and condition. What type of build, types of material use, what's the architecture like? And then the things that most people are familiar with, right? What type of improvements, renovations, flooring? What did they have? They changed the windows. What are the walls? Um, what extent? Of improvements have they done and what the quality level or is there a lot of what we call deferred maintenance zill does not know that right. so you could have a house in very poor condition and we have a scale for that it's c1 through c6 it's similar to the idea of what you use in the real estate profession where you go uh, uh tear down needs major repair average you know fair average excellent above average right you have that scale so where does that home actually fit on that spectrum? And that's why you hire an appraiser to come out and really determine. And then you have the other things like PV, battery, you yeah. know, things like that. It can affect the value. And, and there's ways that we look at that and you know factor that into the whole process. You know, you kind of discussed a lot of great, awesome information. And you talked about permits. So mm -hmm. At least from you know what we see, there's a lot of um, unpermitted. That's right. Um, in in Hawaii, because no one could wait, you know, six months over a year for the DPP to approve small minor changes. Mm -hmm. So in terms of the permit aspect of it, for example, the public record shows three bedrooms, but in reality, there's four bedrooms. Like when you visually see it and inspect it. So how do you evaluate that? Do you see it as four bedrooms and do you look at other comparable four bedrooms or because the uh, the actual permitted work is only three bedrooms, uh, from your perspective, do you only see three mm -hmm. and do you yeah. deduct the, some value for the fourth bedroom? Great question. Uh, going back to the whole automated AI evaluation model, they, they will only go with some public record. So they will only know that. Right. So it used to be more of an issue I've only known of one case in the last few years where a lender said, we are only going to um, approve what is on public record. Now, mm. you mentioned people building in Hawaii, right? right? We have a shortage of housing. We're in a, we've been in a housing crisis for a long time. There's just not enough land to continue to build and there's not enough uh, infrastructure to support it, right? Water, sewer electricity, all of these things, these, these other things that you don't think of why, what you need when you build a community. Um, so um, it's just common across the country. Okay. So about a year and a half ago, yeah. if there was unpermitted living areas, you know, Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac were the second they buy the mortgages and these, these loans that are like FHA, uh, under the housing and development, 
if it wasn't permitted, they gave a lot of kickbacks to it. And that, at that time, I don't know if you remember, people had to move refrigerators out of accessory mm-hmm. units and things like that. But it's so common. And I think what happened was they were losing so many loans that Fannie Mae actually about a year and a half ago said, we don't care. Mm-hmm. As long as what it, what's there is what's, what matters to answer the question. Okay. If it's four bedrooms, then that's what we use. Now, the lenders, it, and and in reality, it's sort of like that's what the fact is, right? If you're going to go buy that home, it's right. four bedrooms. Um, and the lenders are aware of this now, that uh, many times the public record does not reflect. What we do need to do in our job as appraisers is to, um, you know, at our level of expertise, determine if the um, improvement, the actual extra room or something was enclosed like a, like, a, like a patio and now it's a living area that is consistent in the construction quality and the material so that it's kind of seamless. If right. if the construction quality is not consistent with the rest of the dwelling, then you may have an issue. Um, but as, as long as it's there and, and it's not permitted anymore, it it's not that much of an issue when in terms of lending and in terms of our, our value process. So we accept what's there. And that's why we go out and measure. And right, we right. and a lot of times you have a, a four-bedroom house, it's now three. You know, what's really there? And sometimes people change their 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 house quite a bit. And it can vary. So to answer your question, whatever's there, that's pretty much what we go with. And the lending community is pretty much uh on, on board with that now. We have, we see a lot of weird things with ADUs. People consider an accessory dwelling unit. And, uh, you know, it could be attached or detached, which right. by definition is supposed to be subordinate in size. And if you have an R5, 5,000 square foot, uh, 7,500 square foot lot, let's say you can have up to 800 square feet. But we see so many wildly different things. Sometimes the, the accessory is bigger than the main house. But for lending purposes, that's okay. Um, okay. What it is, though, yeah, it, you know, it, yeah. as long as it is um, legal in terms of the zoning, that's fine. But if it doesn't fit the definitions, and we just say that it's non-conforming, it doesn't conform, but it's a legal use, a legal use. No, I appreciate that. Yeah. And, you know, let's say, you know, whether it's a regular uh, real estate transaction, it's an estate sale or a divorce sale, and you produce the appraisal report. And, you know, one of the parties is like, hey, Sean, you know what? I I disagree. Or we want to ask for reconsideration mm-hmm. um, because they're just not happy with their value. What, I mean, have you had those situations and in what type of scenarios would you even consider uh, reevaluating or considering, you know, additional factors? Yeah, it rarely happens to me. Um, I, maybe I can I can think of only really one time in the last year where I, I did, did really reconsider a value. Um, it, it's sometimes this what we call an ROV reconsideration of value. It is a process, and it's something that's been kind of a hot topic this year because there's new rules on that. So in the past, I don't think people were aware. So uh, there's new requirements for the lender now to disclose to people when they're getting their loan mm. for mortgage purpose that they, they can request a reconsideration of value. I take my time with my clients. I sit down and I go over the report with them because it's confusing. There's a lot of lines, a lot of numbers, a lot of information. Typical yeah. report for me for someone is like 28, 30 pages. It's a lot. Um, so sometimes we will get... If let's say the uh, appraised price is less than a contract price in a real estate transaction yeah. purchase, you know, comparables that are sent to us by a, uh, generally, I think it comes from uh, the agent. Um, and then we have to go through a process of um, explaining why we didn't use a certain comparable or why we did something else. And in one case, I had one client sort of push back because a lot of their house was new. So I, I gave it a, a, a rating of a C3, which is pretty average. But in that case, I, I thought the argument was good enough where I changed the condition rating. I thought it was reasonable, which did affect the price. And, you know, um, part of the house was older and part was newer. So I, you know, took that into consideration. And it can happen, but, you know, it's our job to try to catch, you know, balance those things as much as possible. 
And while we're on that subject, you know, sometimes yeah, yeah. the confusion about um, how that all works. So what we actually do, uh, there's three ways we can approach value, and that's what they call the cost approach, and then there's an income approach, which we use mid frequently. Um, uh, if it's a rental situation, we always have to perform that. But um, the sales comparison approach is the gold standard. Yeah. And what we do is we evaluate your home and we take all of its physical characteristics as much as we can gather. And that becomes the standard. So if your house is three bedroom, two bath, then we look at the comparable sales in your that immediate area, ideally. In a period of 90 days, ideally. And then we have to expand sometimes because it's a, let's say you're in Haula, maybe there's not enough sales activity, right? Right, right. But so what we do is we take another, these other homes, let's say another one's a four bedroom, then we adjust the bedroom count so that the comparables are not going to be exactly the same. Even in a condo, you could have exposure to the ocean versus the mountain and, or you're facing a building or floor level could, you know, there's always some differences. So our job is to try to make that comparable as equal to the subject, which would be your property, for example, as possible. And that's where the sales comparison, all of these adjustments that we make, that's the purpose of it. When we look at the, you know, price that it sold at versus what, when we go through all of our math, what did we come up with? And then we go through a process of reconciling all of that. And, um sometimes going through that type of information with a client on a personal level will um be enough like i actually printed out a couple graphs today uh because i had the situation this year yeah people bought their house in 22 2022 and they were trying to dispose of it in 2024 and they thought they were going to have more value but they don't <laughs> and I have done this type of analysis yeah. many times and I've seen the same thing throughout the islands. I don't know if you can see this. So this is 2021, right? Between 21 and 2022, we had a real sharp increase in price. This is, by the way, the Waianae area. Hmm. And so we had a peak March 23, and then we had a decline. So essentially, now is kind of where it was in 2022. And I see this yeah. over and over and over again. 21, 22, it's at the top of 23, this is 24, and we're basically back to where we were. So sometimes explaining things like this yeah. to the client that they expected, you know, here we are, 22. And then now we're back, 2024. 20, it's about the same. And so I do this for individual markets, especially with the retrospective appraisals. Um, and it is just yeah. unfortunate. And there's a lot of reasons why those prices went up so high, like right, 15%, right. partially from interest rates and partially because of people teleworking. A lot of people moved to Hawaii during COVID because, they, hey, why don't we just move to Hawaii if we're just going to work from home? And that really put a, a lot of demand on the market and drove prices up significantly. That is, uh, that's a great perspective. Yeah, yeah. I, I didn't really realize, you know, kind of 2022, some adjustments in 2023 and then kind of back right. you know, where we're at 2022. And, you know, as we unwind or wind down in this interview, um, I mean, it was like jam packed and yeah. I definitely want to bring you back for another session. Uh, if you're open to that, any last words, you know, for for our audience, and also like, how, how do people reach out to you? Well, if you want to reach out to me, it's very easy. Just look up Appraise It Hawaii on Google, and you'll see. And I got a lot of Google reviews, and contact me very easily through there. And you can uh, call me that that you know, or email me, or just put something on my website. And I got a lot of Google reviews, so people can can see, um, you know, that. You know, I'm just not a fly by night guy. Yeah, um, yeah. I, I think it's important. I think in in the, in just for people, if they have questions about their property value and what they should do, they should just call. And and I'm happy to talk story, and even with uh, agents or people that are lo looking at maybe adding some square footage to their house and they want to know how we're going to look at it. Mm -hmm. You know, because there's a concept of uh, contributory value. You can put a lot of money into your home and then not see the return. And there's a lot of ways that can happen. 
Um, you can over improve essentially. Um, and I, I think the last thing is, you know, th I think there's a lot of good things happening in the market and there's still opportunities. Um, the interest rates are dropping and I think that'll, that'll be a very positive thing. People can afford to buy more home, you know, and, and I think that's going to be, uh, our business should, should be a lot uh, picking up. I would think, you know, I definitely agree with you and really appreciate your time. Shanti Wanak of Appraise It Hawaii. So just Google that, Appraise It Hawaii, one word. That's right. And thank you so much. Thank you. Mahalo. Aloha.